Okay, our speaker for this evening is Roger Shu. Mr. Shu has a master's in science in geology from UNC Chapel Hill, a master's in science edu uh, education. Uh, he's a joint lecturer at UNCW in the departments of earth and ocean sciences and environmental sciences. He is involved in studies of coastal issues and processes and surface and groundwater sources and quality in Southeastern North Carolina. He has provided input on discussions of offshore energy resources, having worked in the energy industry, coastal hazards and water resources. Other interests include geoscience and environmental education. He works with numerous groups on a wide range of projects, including the design and construction of best management practices for stormwater runoff and on studies of threatened ecosystems, endangered species, restoration projects and mitigation. Superfund sites and water quality. He is on the sustainability committee of UNCW and on the boards of Cape Fear River Watch and the Cape Fear Conservation Collaboration. We are um, thrilled to have Mr. Shu uh, to speak to us this evening. Thank you, Anne. Everybody see that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks for asking me to talk with you tonight. Sierra Club's obviously one of my favorite organizations. And so what I thought I'd do tonight, uh, based on some discussions, is to kind of have a threefold presentation. And one of the things that we're going to try and do is talk about some places to go, things to see, and a few issues associated with those. And... One of the things about Southeastern North Carolina, uh, it has a lot of subtleties that a lot of people don't appreciate, but once you get out and see some of the areas, you can see how beautiful they actually are. And these are just a few of the sites that we're gonna try and take a look at and talk about some of the issues as well. And if there's time at the end, uh, we could talk for days about all the rules and regulations that are impacting uh, the United States now, as well as North Carolina and even our local area, but uh, we'll try and touch on just a couple of those uh, as well. That's national policy issues too. So of course, I'm a geologist, so I had to start off with something like this to show you, you know, what our context is for North Carolina. Basically, three of the physiographic provinces, from the Blue Ridge to the Piedmont and the Coastal Plain, and of course, all of that's controlled by the underlying geology. And in the coastal plain here in this false infrared map, as you see on top, you can see the difference in dominantly agricultural areas versus deciduous trees as you move on up into the Blue Ridge area. And they tell me this is the, or last weekend was the peak weekend for the colors. So you can still go and see them at lower elevations. But down here in our area, one of the things that you might notice are there, uh, there are some really red areas like Holly Shelter, the Green Swamp, Boiling Spring Lakes, along the Cape Fear River uh, Basin are areas that have not been impacted as much yet with development. You can see New Hanover County here and looking at it, there's not a whole lot of red, even though we have a fairly good tree population in New Hanover County, really New Hanover County is really getting basically fully developed. And all the biodiversity that used to be in New Hanover County, fortunately, we still have it in some of the surrounding counties like Brunswick, Pender, and Columbus counties. So just to show you what I think are some of the North Carolina seven natural wonders, we can go all the way from the Smoky Mountains and the Blue Ridge, got Mount Mitchell sitting up there, uh, some of the falls that occur in the area like Linville Falls. We also got areas like Pilot Mountain. That's, uh, kind of a, a attraction for a lot of people and it's been a landmark for travelers for a long period of time in North Carolina. The fall line separates the Piedmont from the coastal plain and that's the area where there was fast flowing streams in the Piedmont and it changed into the slow flowing meandering river systems in the coastal plain. This is of course where many of the cities are developed on the uh, east coast. We also have the Triassic basins which formed as the uh, incipient Atlantic Ocean started to form back in Triassic time. And these are the sites of some of the 
early coal uh, exploration associated with the Civil War in North Carolina. It's also the place where some people were talking about natural gas exploration. I wouldn't worry too much about that. There's not a whole lot there. Uh, then we got Carolina Bays, which are still a mystery and how they formed. There's a nexus of their occurrence in southeastern North Carolina, in particular Bladen County. We also have our longleaf pines and carnivorous plants uh, in our area. And of course, our barrier island complexes are really fantastic as well. If we go a little bit further, I want to go into our area now. And so these are what I call shoes, coastal plain natural wonders. And these are the ones that I think have so much attraction, so much value to us here, uh, aesthetics, but also true value in economics as well, not just for tourism, but for fisheries and other things. So longleaf pines, carnivorous plants, again, Carolina bays, our bottomland hardwoods are really a rich resource for many reasons. Our Black River uh, waters, particularly the Black River, but also the Northeast Cape Fear River. And as we go down toward the Barrier Islands, we have not just the Barrier Islands, but I separate out the salt marshes because they really are key to many things, our nursery grounds, if you will, for many of our species. And of course, the location of many of the areas that we have for our keystone species, the Eastern Oyster. So here's some places that you guys can get. And the Cape Fear Arch, what we've done is divided up uh, the areas in southeastern North Carolina. It also includes part of South Carolina too. But I'm just going to focus on North Carolina here. We divided the areas of significance, what we call focal areas, into the river riparian zone. That's just the zone adjacent to the river. We also divided another section into terrestrial ecosystems and the last one into the coastal zone. So define those as being the colors here for the river and the terrestrial and then the coastal zone as you see it. So all of these have been defined as having significance. And one of the things that we've talked about many times, not just in um, Cape Fear Arch, but in any time you discuss ecosystems and biodiversity, one of the real keys is having connected areas or corridors. And so this is a real big focus of the Nature Conservancy and others to make sure that we have not just isolated, but connected ecosystems for us. And of course, one of the reasons why we have such rich biodiversity in Southeastern North Carolina is because we have you know, a really varied uh, area of what we call soils, natural communities, and ecosystems. Here's just a few of them. You can see the Zurich Sandhill communities, Boiling Spring Lakes is uh, kind of famous for having those, but UNCW's campus as well, much of the lonely pine forest is Zurich Sandhill uh, community. The green swamp is a little bit different with a wet pine savanna and also all the pocosins associated with it. We also have our bottomland hardwoods and blackwater streams. This particular one is down at Ebb Henwood Preserve. Then we have lots of tidal creeks and inlets. This one is Lockwood's Folly. You can see all the nice meandering stream parts of that tidal creek. And of course, all this is marshy area uh, adjacent to it. And then of course, we've got our barrier island systems and uh, very importantly, the inlets, because those are very active areas. And so all of these barrier islands have lots of beauty, but also a few issues associated with them. So species richness or biodiversity is one of the things that we really look at in our area. So here are 11 locations that you guys should definitely take advantage of. Uh, this is some uh, areas that are all within an hour and a half, 90 minutes of Wilmington. And each one of them has something unique to offer. For instance, up here at number one, those are the Bladen Lake State Forest. This area has really nice forest areas, but also the Carolina Bays uh, that you can go to. Of course, the giant Carolina Bay, although some folks consider that not a bay, uh, Lake Waccamaw. You can also see the Black River area. And in this area, excuse me, I moved those. Three should be the Cape Fear, and two should be the Black River. Sorry. Wow, I've already made a mistake. Oh my goodness. 
So then we've got other areas that we've got for the green swamp down here uh, of Henwood, all the beaches down along the coast in Brunswick, as well as along the New Hanover County uh, line. Baldhead Island or Smith Island is pretty particularly uh, fascinating with its maritime forests too. So anyway, all these are varieties of natural communities. Hey, it's the variety vacation land, like the song always said from North Carolina. Those of you in North Carolina, old timers know that song. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is try to divide this up into looking at this. Uh, these are a few sites for the riparian zone and the river systems, then we'll look at some of the uh, terrestrial and then move to the coastal. So these are ones that I think are particularly uh, pretty important to us and also quite scenic. Just a trip to the Lock and Dam number one on the Cape Fear River, uh, just inside the Bladen County line. You know, all three of our locks and dams on the Cape Fear River are all located with Bladen County. And of course, the really important thing about this one is that's where our water comes from, right behind the uh, now Rock Arch Rapid and Lock and Dam. The Carolina Bays, as you see them, and also the area where we have our now famous fifth oldest tree in the entire world and the oldest trees east of the Mississippi in the United States. Uh, Northeast Cape Fear River and the Ghost Forest, some of this related to the changing salinity that we had. Doesn't take a whole lot of change in salinity to lead to the decimation of some of the uh, marsh systems because the sulfate that comes in with the uh, salt water can actually degrade some of these muds as well. So you can lose your trees, but also the marsh if you have too much salt water coming up the system. So let me just show a couple of things on each one of these and we'll move to it that way. So Carolina Bays are pretty spectacular. This is a LIDAR image also showing you elevation, higher elevation red. Obviously the greens down here are the streams and the floodplains associated with them. You can see that the Carolina Bays occur on the upland divides between those streams. So that gives you an idea of age of those. You can see in this case up at White Lake, which is the developed uh, lake. This is Jones Lake State Park, which I prefer myself, lots less people, and a nice trail to walk around uh, as well. And of course, we still don't know for sure exactly why they are there. Some people have supposed that meteorites uh, blew up above the land surface and carved them out. Uh, some people have said, and this is the most appreciated or thought to be correct idea, is that some shallow depressions were modified by the prevailing winds that we have in southeastern North Carolina, which is dominantly from the southwest and also from the northeast, depending upon the time of year. Actually, my favorite ones just to talk about, though, is the presence of a giant beaver that swam around and you know, did its thing, but also the large fish and whales swimming in circles you know, to carve out those shallow depressions for the base. And they really are shallow depressions. You know, they're only you know, five to 10 feet deep max. Uh, so they are oriented, as you see, from the northwest to the southeast. That's why some people believe that that was you know, part of a above ground meteorite, like the one that happened in uh, Russia in the early 1900s. And so all these areas are just pretty nifty to go out and see because these lakes are pretty, but actually there's a lot more Carolina Bays than there are lakes and many of these have been exploited to make farming because it's rich soils that are in there and they're made they're named bays uh, Carolina bays because of all the bay trees that are associated with them and this is one of my favorite trees the red bay that occurs around some of these and the red bay is pretty important to us uh, lots of animals like the berries and others and if you wanted to you know, do your thing with medicinal plants. You could use some of this to uh, reduce your fevers, headaches, constipation, a lot of different stuff. If you got uh, rheumatic joints, you can fix that as well. But one of the things to just mention about Red Bay, something's happening in southeastern U.S. that's not really good. It turns out that we have what's called the laurel wilt and this beetle right here, the ambrosia beetle, uh, 
is carrying a fungus that very quickly can decimate the red bay population. Once they get into the tree, it introduces the fungus into the tree, the tree will die you know, within weeks. And so what happened, it came in as an invasive species here in Savannah. And you can see in this particular case, how it's moved over time to the north and also to the south. Florida is fully engulfed now and what you can see in Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina is that it's right all in the coastal plain here. And you can see that there's other invasive species like the emerald ash borer and others that's there, but really this has been devastating. The Persia is in the same family as the avocado. Some, some people are worried that this will jump and start destroying some of the avocado uh, as well. So another place to look at then is the Cape Fear River and the Lock and Dam system. I mentioned to you that our water sourced just above Lock and Dam number one. There's two big pipes that come into here and it's transported about 24 miles to Wilmington and Brunswick County. We get about 15 million gallons a day for Wilmington, New Hanover County and Brunswick gets about three to six million gallons. Pender is just tapping into this as well to get a million to two million gallons too. So it's very important that we maintain a healthy watershed and river system. Why this dam and lock was put in here to begin with was to move barge traffic from Wilmington all the way to Fayetteville. Uh, that kind of ended in the late part of the last century. And so it's been isolated uses since that time. For a while, they were actually locking the fish up the river because our anadromous fish species that you see here want to go upstream to spawn. And so they were kind of restricted with a dam. So the lock master would take the fish, they'd open the lock, let the fish swim in, they'd raise the water level and let them go on up. And it turned out about 25% of the fish could actually get up to their original spawning grounds that way. But we wanted to do a little bit better. And so in 2013, uh, with an agreement uh, when they deepened the port, there was compensation monies that was associated with that. So that money went to put in the rock arch rapid, as you see here, that was designed so that the fish could swim up that no matter what the level of the water. Because even at low water, this really fantastic design has water funneling right through the middle of it. So even at low water, you can still swim the, this thing. Turned out that the shad got about 65% was going over uh, that rock arch, but only about 25% of our uh, striped bass. And so there's a design uh, parameter now that's being looked at to change that to make it more friendly for striped bass to move up. Some fish like to be you know, together with others, others like to be independent. So you need different kinds of gaps in the rock and different kinds of resting pools for them to be able to move up that system. By the way, these were built all the way back in 1915 to 30. So you can see this has been a long running condition. Some people always ask us at Riverwatch, you know, why don't you just take out the dams if you don't need the locks anymore? Well, the problem with doing that, you would lower the water level by 11 to 12 feet and that's gonna compromise your water intake on the back side of that. So that wouldn't work very well for removing that dam. So how much water is actually flowing over uh, the river system? This is low water. You can see water is still flowing over only 529 million gallons per day. And you're probably saying only 529 million gallons. Well, it turns out that the average is three and a half billion gallons a day. That's the average over a 40 year period of time for the Cape Fear River. This would be high flow, a little bit higher flow, 7.7 .7 billion. And then this is Hurricane Matthew. So 42 billion gallons a day. You can't even see the lock and dam system in that picture. It was that high. But really that's nothing compared to Hurricane Florence, which is now the storm of record for the Cape Fear River. During that, it was 51 billion gallons a day was moving over that lock and dam system. So imagine if you will, if you had 51 billion milk jugs that passed by that point on one day. That's how much water flowed over the lock and dam system. So there's Florence in 2018 at 51 billion gallons. These were two 500 year flood events. In fact, Florence was approaching a thousand year flood event uh, on the Cape Fear River. 
Of course, there are some issues that we have on the river too. I know you all know all about uh, PFAS chemicals. And that started way back. Uh, people knew about it from the Star News in June of 2017. But actually, people had reported on this before then. It just wasn't very well known. And this has been continued to today. In fact, earlier this year, DEQ released some data that they got testing from all the water treatment and systems uh, along the Cape Fear River Basin. And you can see them here. So I said, uh, well, what was this really high value of PFAS? Now, PFAS is a generic, you know, kind of all-inclusive term for all the per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. This isn't just Gen X. There's a whole bunch of these toxic substances that we need to be uh, aware of, not just Gen X. So they measured 4,026 parts per trillion. By the way, for reference, the advisory that EPA gives for the PFAS and PFOA is 70 parts per trillion. So what they found in the waters in Sanford was that it had 1,000 parts per trillion of those, but it had 4,000 parts total. This was not at Kimor's, this was not at the Lock and Dam, this was not at the Sweeney treatment plant. So there's Kimor's right here. You can see my lower arrow. Sanford and Burlington are north of there. So Kimor's is not the only source of PFAS chemicals in our river system. And in fact, when you look at the United States, many if not most of our waterways have some contamination from PFAS chemicals. So DEQ looked at all this to give some information. And so that's kind of concerning. We don't know what the cumulative impacts of PFAS chemicals are. We do know that they're harmful for kidneys and other. But fortunately, there's been some good news of late. Um, in fact, there's been the approval uh, with Kimors and Riverwatch, but also DEQ and others is to have an agreement to have a reduction of not just the air, but the water and even the groundwater to reduce the amount of any of these chemicals by over 99%. And so for the air, they put in this thermal oxidizer to uh, destroy those. And also there's been the recent agreement to reduce uh, Kimor's chemical water pollution, including that that's in the groundwater system that's continuing to seep into the Cape Fear River. So bad news, good news kind of thing. Well, let's move on over to the Black River. This is the area kind of has Pender County and Bladen County on either side of the river system. And this area right here is pretty important. This is called the Napco Tract. This was just acquired in 2018. You might say, well, so what, big deal? Well, this was a missing piece in the puzzle for the Black River because this is one of the areas that has some of the oldest trees in it. So the Nature Conservancy and others have been in the process of years trying to acquire enough acreage along the river to form a state park. That hasn't come to fruition, but at least a lot of land has been conserved along this whole area of the Black River. And of course, is beautiful unto itself. In fact, November is probably the best time if you want to see the trees changing. The cypress will start changing to nice brown colors and be really, really pretty. This is pretty in itself, but November is a great time to be up there kayaking. So North Carolina bald cypresses uh, were found and cored uh, by Staley and our own C.R. Robbins, uh, has taken lots of people up there. This is Angie Carl, who was with the TNC, uh, Southeastern uh, TNC Fireballs. Uh, she's unfortunately gone out west, uh, but uh, we still claim her. So this is the oldest owned bald cypress in the Black River Preserve at 2,624 years old. Uh, they think there may be some older ones, but that's pretty old. As you can see here, this is the ages. You can see it's the fifth oldest tree in the entire world. So that's pretty big deal for all of us in this area. And plus, it's just a great place to go kayak and get away from it all too. Of course, there's issues along the Black River too. 
uh, as well as many of our areas. You might notice this picture up here of southeastern North Carolina. The pinks are swine operations and the yellows are poultry operations. Sampson and Duplin counties have more CAFOs, more concentrated animal feeding operations than any other county in the United States. And it's not to say anything that we, you know, against the pigs and poultry, but the real issue with these is that you have such a large number that it's difficult to handle all the waste. And of course, historically, some of these have been near or in the floodplain, such as shown with these. This is one on the Black River, as you can see up here. That's what it would be. There's the pig operation. There's the lagoon. Well, this is what happened when one of the storms. So whenever you have you know, inundation of the lagoons and the pig operations, then those flow into the river systems. And then one on the Northeast Cape Fear River right here, you can see these. These are not pig operations because there's no lagoon there. You can always tell if it's a pig operation, there's gotta be a lagoon there because that's how they handle the waste. And here you can see this one inundated also by water during a flood event. So what's shown in this blue is the 100 year floodplain area. So we definitely wanna, don't wanna have uh, animal operations of any sort in the 100 year floodplain. And this is what happened here in Florence. Uh, there were 4.1 million chickens and turkeys uh, that died and over 5,000 pigs. This is again a poultry operation in these barns. And what you see coming out of the barns there is the effluent. Of course, poultry have dry waste. Uh, pigs have wet waste. That's why they have them in the lagoons. So this is the animal waste uh, feces going down and there's the stream right there. So you just need to be cognizant of where you're at, the numbers that you have and how we actually maintain these. There's a lot of issues with social and economic justice associated with animal operations as well now. So let's go to our forest, our terrestrial ecosystems for a minute. Uh, this is looking at a few places like the Green Swamp, uh, some upland forest areas, bottomland hardwoods. So the coastal plain and the uh, Gulf and Atlantic coastal plains were collectively named a global biodiversity hotspot in 2016. Uh, says that the coastal plain has a really remarkably high number of unique species that are found nowhere else on earth. And this is just to show you some of that species richness in vascular plants like 6200 endemic just to this area 1816. So this is showing you a lot of the biodiversity that's in this location. And if you just look at Boiling Spring Lakes and the Green Swamp, there's over 400 different species in those areas. So these are pretty remarkable areas too. This is a picture of um, shoestring savanna in the green swamp, as a matter of fact. And this is after a burn, you can see the areas, the shrubs have been burned and the grasses start coming back uh, nice and healthy. And this of course is one of the savannas. It's really beautiful there, it's a heritage site. And what you can see with this is how the pines are widely dispersed with lots of grass and herbs on the bottom, the herbaceous layers, you see it. And of course, this is the area where you see lots of our carnivorous plants, including our state carnivorous plant, the Venus flytrap. And really importantly, when you start getting down to the details of the ecosystem and the communities, what you'll see is the wet pine savanna out here I go down two feet of elevation to what we call the magic zone, it's the ecotone. This is where a lot of the carnivorous plants live, as well as many other flowering species. In fact, the green swamp, just like many wet pine savannas, if you go to different times of year from April through November, you'll see different kinds of wildflowers there. And then of course you hit the wall. Over here is really dense picosa. And the only difference there, that's three feet of elevation difference. The difference here is the soils and the wetness that you see. This material you would have to hack your way through with a machete. And over here, you can see how open it really is. And so these are just some of the species that you might see in that transect. And here you can see the soils that controls that. 
this slightly less organic, less rich soil out here versus what you'd see at the Pocosin. See all the more black material, that's the organics and the wetness associated with it. And of course, one of the big things in our area is naval stores. Wilmington is the naval stores capital of the entire world for a century. Uh, naval stores went out from here to all around the world uh, for caulking ships and providing medicines and other things. And of course, in our area, we have lots of indications of notch trees. We've got some on the campus UNCW. There's lots down in the green swamp. And of course, there's also some tar kilns. And if you go up to Bladen Lake State Park area and the forest up there, you can even see an old turpentine still uh, that you can see how it actually worked in that area. So this was, of course, based just like our rice culture in our area on slave labor. And the change from you know, wooden to metal ships, but also the change in uh, slave labor in North Carolina and the Southeast really put an end to uh, the turpentine industry. It was kind of a specialized industry after 1900. There are tar kilns and notch trees that were done up through the 1940s though. So what are the threats to our pine systems and other areas? So some of the threats are absence of fire. This is absolutely critical in our longleaf pines, which are pyroclimax communities or fire climax communities. Of course, there's other things that is important, uh, habitat alteration, overexploitation of the resource, and of course, in our area, development and habitat loss. Uh, New Hanover and Pender counties are fast growing, but Brunswick County is even the fastest growing, uh, fastest growing county in the entire state. And it's been in the top 10 in the whole US for several different years over the last decade. You can also see that there's been a change in uh, or alteration of the habitat. Straight lines, if you see them in nature, I've said this to many of you before, is that if it's a straight line in nature, then humans made it. So here you can see straight lines for ditching and roads. Back in 1938 near Lake Waccamaw, 1955, and then 1990. All of this is for silviculture. So it will be into the forest. And I'm not criticizing forestry because forestry is a $20 billion a year industry in North Carolina. It's really an important part of the North Carolina economic database. Some of our things, not like our longleaf pines, we get a little bit wetter. So we got these bottomland hardwoods. Uh, these are just a couple of pictures along the Cape Fear. Uh, as you can see, you can see the buttressing of the trees in our cypress as well as our black gum. Uh, some people look at those as to be more stabilization in these kind of loosey-goosey organic rich soils that helps for stability of the plants. And of course, you can see the sometimes it's wet, sometimes it's a little bit drier. Overall, there's not a whole lot of vegetation on the bottom until you have a tree fall and then all kinds of things will start growing there. But it's a dense shade for most of the year until they lose their leaves in the wintertime. Bottomland hybrids have a really lot of benefits. They store flood water, so you reduce flooding if you have healthy hardwoods. You can also improve the water quality because of infiltration associated with those soils. They trap sediments, of course, when the rivers flood themselves, you know, the silts and the clays move out of the system. And then, of course, it's really spectacular for numerous species that live in these areas. Uh, this is a boardwalk trail up at Lock and Dam number one, for those of you who might want to go up there and have a little dry walk into you know, the bottomland hardwoods. I've seen all kinds of things up there, including prothonotary warblers and others. And you can also go to a place like F. Henwood and see everything. In this particular case, we got bottomland hardwoods and blackwater streams. We got an upland forest where we've got beech trees, Darlington oaks, as well as uh, loblolly pines. And now we're starting to restore because this area was definitely uh, one that had lots of longleaf pines in it historically. So we're restoring five to seven acres of longleaf pines in that area. You get some of it back to what it was. And at the same time, we're trying to maintain the biodiversity there by keeping the upland forest 
lonely pines, bottomland, but also old fields. These old fields are really critical for some of our different species like field mice, rabbits, and many kinds of birds as well. And some are like these. Uh, these are just some of the species that we might find in some of these lonely pine and bottomland hardwoods. Uh, in fact, I was on campus today and uh, just looked over there and there was a fox squirrel, one of my favorites. So this one has the classic kind of white nose and white ears with the black face on it. Eastern box turtle, uh, which is our state turtle as well. You can also see the turkeys. We have lots of turkeys. By the way, when I was a kid, there were no turkeys in this area. I grew up here. So now they've really made a remarkable comeback, just like the black bear. There were very few whenever I was growing up. They had all been hunted out and uh, really reduced in numbers dramatically. So a lot of these have made remarkable comebacks for our area. And Darcy W or red cockaded woodpecker uh, that you see here. And my personal favorite, the pileated woodpecker. Too. So what are some issues for this? Well, one issue might be is the wood pellet business. Now, wood pellets are a growing a U.S. import, uh, export, and I told you that forestry and forestry products are really important to North Carolina, and it really is important. And, you know, having a market for wood uh, is a good thing. The only problem is whenever you advertise it uh, for what it's not intended to be. Using wood pellets and trees, shipping them to England uh, for use for energy, when they say that these are carbon neutral, that's just not true. Uh, these particular pellets are made supposedly from scrap material uh, that would just be left on the ground. And that's true to a degree, but they're also using some trees as well that many people have found uh, too. What you can see with this picture is that North Carolina has four different processing plants for wood pellets. North Carolina is becoming the number one producer of wood pellets for the entire world now. And the United States is the number one producer of wood pellets uh, in the world. You can see this, how it's really increasing. And it's really, you know, pretty silly. <laughs> you know, the fact that they're considering these to be totally carbon neutral. Uh, this is really not true. And other places though, like Japan and Korea are starting to consider this as well. So when you look at this, you know, the Trump's EPA is expected to propose a rule declaring that burning biomass is carbon neutral. And if you did it exactly right, that would be close to true. But in this particular case, this is not true. So as the US has become the world supplier, of wood pellets, North Carolina is really at its epicenter. So is it carbon neutral? Well, the wood pellet based fuel comprised of biogenic carbon derived from working forest. You recycle the carbon, okay? And then the trees that you plant will uptake that carbon that's burned whenever you burn the pellets. Fossil fuels, you know, like coal or other, when you burn that, it's not gonna have anything replanted. So basically you're releasing that carbon to the atmosphere. Well, a mature tree, when you cut it down, you, you have a lot of carbon in that tree and that tree is continuously uh, sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. So when you cut it down and put it in a small tree, it's not gonna be a replacement. It's gonna take 21 to 90 years to pull that carbon back out. So the question is, are you going to be able to uh, satisfy the reduction in carbon that some people believe we need to by waiting 21 to 90 years to actually you know, capture that carbon again? So this is not carbon neutral, no matter how you shake it out, at least in my opinion. So this is what SELC came up with a couple of years ago. And what they said was that Scenario A, which is basically using trees. Scenario B is using trees and scraps and stuff. And this one down here, this little gray, is if you were to use just limbs and debris that's not used for anything else. If you get over this line for these, 
then basically you're producing more carbon than you would if you were burning coal. So the only way to be comparable to that in SELC's analysis was to only use the little bit of scraps. And this is the classic thing that the Dogwood Alliance and others came up with and showed the trees that were being used for making these pellets. Well, let's move on down a little bit. Uh, this is Eagles Island, obviously Wilmington uh, on the east bank over here, the battleship and all this on the west bank. There's the Cape Fear River coming down. Isabel Holmes Bridge, and then the Northeast Cape Fear River. And this is one of the dredge spoil islands up on the Cape Fear uh, and our kayak where we paddled up there. And if you look at that particular one, that kayak is sitting right there. You can see those two tree mounds. Those are two tree mounds right over there. So we just paddled up to here. It's a nice, easy paddle uh, up the river. If you want, you can catch the tide. It helps you out some uh, as well. But what's the thing about Eagles Island? It's really a significant area. A lot of us have been talking about this for a long time of trying to preserve all of that, you know, for some kind of a natural or conservation preservation area. There is still some privately owned land uh, in this area. And of course, there's all kinds of other good things on the island. You look at this, you see these straight lines? Well, you know now those are not nature. So that's people. These are the old rice fields. So the Gullah Geechee uh, heritage went all the way up to Southern Pender County. So all of these rice fields that you see in here, unfortunately, some of these are starting to go away because of some of the increase in water levels uh, in these areas. And of course, we got a few issues there. Uh, there's the battleship across the way. So there's the Cape Fear River, which is now in the street. So what is that? The name of that street is Water Street. So this is nuisance flooding. This is just sunny day, perigeal, king tide, whichever word you wanna use, that's what it is. And in fact, you might've heard that we just had this weekend several notices on NPR and others to say we're going to have coastal flooding. And the reason that is, is because we had new moon and also the moon was at its closest point to the earth. So we had these super tides. So instead of having the usual three to four feet, you know, you had another six or so inches on top of that. And Wilmington is having an increasing number of these days of nuisance flooding. And it's going to get even more as we continue because as sea level rises a little bit then the tide on top of that moves up even more and more and more. And this, of course, is the roadway going to the battleship. So what do you think? There's the battleship. There's the parking lot. At least part of it, most of it's underwater. Back in February of this year, they had to shut down the battleship tourism because of floodwaters in there. And it wasn't a storm, it wasn't anything but high tide flooding, perigeal flooding. This is the roadway. So I told Terry Bragg over at the battleship and others that if they're gonna maintain this, which is one of the biggest tourist attractions in North Carolina, they're gonna to have to do something about access for that area. And believe it or not, some people want to build a house down in here. I'm serious. <laughs> they wanted to build a mixed use community in this area. So let me just show you how this looks on a map. This is my base map. And I want you to look closely now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through mean highest high water, which is the high, high tide. Then you're going to have one foot above that, three feet and five feet. So there is mean highest high water. That's one foot above that. Three feet and five feet. Now three feet, as you see it right there, many people believe three feet is what we will likely get. Many people put it at more than that. Some people put it at a foot and a half, but three feet is a pretty good uh, indicator or 2100. 
I won't be here to see it, but in looking at that, people should be concerned. There's the battleship up there. And of course, that's in the street at the Water Street. And there's just the inundation. That's a minor flood event. So one of the things that you guys can make comment, by the way, tomorrow night, uh, October 20th, is they're going to have a meeting, uh, DEQ. It's a hearing to listen to us to say, well, we shouldn't have the Lower Cape Fear River as a swamp classification. You might have heard about this a few years ago. They changed this from uh, SC waters to SC or CSW waters. So swamp waters in this area. And what a swamp water is, it has a lower uh, dissolved oxygen, has a lower pH and also moves very slow. Well, EPA basically said, guys, you can't do that. So EPA wrote letters to DEQ to say, this should not be classified as a swamp. So we believe this is a done deal, but it doesn't hurt for people to go ahead and say something as well. So tomorrow night, you'd have your opportunity to listen in or make your own comment to get this classified as what it should be appropriately as class C waters, not SW waters. And then another thing that's an issue for us here in uh, North Carolina, Wilmington, this is the port. This is one of those major cargo uh, container vessels, as you see here. And this particular one, there's been uh, EISs and EAs made on this. By the way, there's the pellet holders right there, those little guys. And what they're wanting to do, we're currently at 42 feet of depth in the Cape Fear. Uh, there's a goal to deepen that to 44 to 47 feet so that you can get larger ships. Got these post Panamax ships like this. We want to get into some of these ultra, at least the Wilmington Port wants to get into the ultra Panamax ships or there. So why is that an issue? Well, whenever you deepen the river, then you're allowing more salt water to intrude in the lower part of the river system. And the other thing that happens these larger ships, they've got to widen these for the turnaround. And so all of these areas along here, at least some of them are primary nursery grounds too. So again, you just need to design and plan and determine what the benefits and hazards are associated with these. This is true of anything that we do. And then we've got some fantastic tidal creeks in New Hanover County, as well as in Brunswick County and Pender. This is Bradley Creek. This is Bradley Creek. Look at all that marsh area associated with that. Isn't it beautiful you know, be to sit there and look at the marsh areas? And so this area, we've got all of these tidal creeks on this side in green, drain into the intracoastal waterway in the Atlantic and all the yellows over on this side drain into the Cape Fear River. And then of course, you can see it much better on this uh, LIDAR image. So basically showing topography, you can see all the tidal creeks right there. See that point? That's College Road. That's the high point. So our guys were really smart. They put College Road on the highest point in the middle of the county, separating that. So that's the drainage divide basically between all those areas. But, you know, we got an issue or two with that too, because we got so much impervious surfaces that, you know, this leads to lots of runoff. And so whenever you're looking at this, anytime you get over 10 to 12% impervious surfaces, our waterways are gonna be impaired. This is not just true and been found in Wilmington, Maryland, South Carolina, Louisiana, all these places found the exact same thing. And it's because all the oils, all the antifreeze, all the dog poop and everything else that's on the hard surfaces are gonna run off into our waterways. And once it gets in the waterway, it's really tough to clean it up. So what we need to do is keep it from going into that waterway first. That's the only way to really protect these areas. And of course, many of these areas you see the red, those are now off limits to shell fishing. So what's the definition of pollution? The definition of pollution is a water that does not meet its intended usage. So if I were to be able to pick up shell fishing here, that water would meet its intended usage, but these don't. And the main thing for that is fecal coliform 
bacteria. So let's go on down to the coast now, see some really nice places like Masonboro Island uh, out here. And this is a little turtle we saw when we were out on Masonboro one time. You can see Masonboro right there. Nice beach to the dunes and to the marsh. Some fantastic uh, birds. This is my favorite, the oyster catcher. And then we've got the maritime forest and marshes like on Bald Headed Island. So one of the ways that I kind of like to look at places is transects. It gives me an idea of the kinds of topography, the vegetation, and everything else about it. So these are just pictures on Masonboro showing you the beach to the dunes, to the overwash fans, the marsh transition, and then into the marsh. And of course, when you look at these two, you think about this transition going from not just the grasses and others, but also the animals that frequent these areas. On Mason Bird, there's lots of studies now looking at the marsh sparrow and others. And of course, then you can go out there and you can find the great blue heron. And this is the area for our nursery grounds right there. Our primary nursery grounds in there is just an invaluable, irreplaceable source of wealth for us. So if I stay on the beach, I've got my mole crabs and my coquina and the ghost crab here. Uh, all of these guys up here kind of, you know, you, you go down there and you can look, you can see their little antennas and stuff coming out. Uh, the wave washes up and as the water runs back, they stick up their antenna to filter feed. Those of you who are fishermen, you might have used this guy to fish with at some point in time. And of course, we also have our turtles. And we had some fantastic news in 2019. There were more nesting turtle sites uh, in North Carolina than any other time in history. There were 2,300 nests that were recorded. And of course, the really benefit of that was because of all the actions done in the 1980s and 1990s, because the work that was done then is why we got so many turtles now. Because Coretta here is going to leave the beach and won't be back again until 2045. So hopefully Coretta will be able to make that journey and get back to have another record population, you know, at that time. So we got lots of birds on the beach and the dune area and those flats, we call them sand flats. Got lots of fantastic plants on the beach and dunes as well as going into the marsh areas. And here you can see some of that transect as I've talked about before. Of course, down here is where I have our fantastic Eastern oyster, oyster across the Street of Virginica. It really is a keystone species which means that it's so important for the area. And the value in North Carolina every year is about $4 million for oysters in North Carolina. And the other thing that's really important here is you see these red zones and blues? Those are primary nursery grounds. All of those areas are critical habitat and feeding spots for lots of these fish, as well as other uh, larvae that are in these uh, areas. Some of these stay in these uh, marsh areas all their lives. Others will move in and out of the river down into uh, the ocean. But you know, there's something to be concerned about too associated with our areas. We have what's called erosion. So erosion is whenever the land surface is moving back. And Many of our areas in North Carolina have some major or some uh, erosion. There are places that have accretion and accretion is just growing the beach. Looking at a piece of area from Curie Beach down to Bald Head and over to Oak Island, these things in pinks and reds are areas where I'm eroding the land. The blues are where I'm gaining some land. What we do in North Carolina is you take an average of two feet a year no matter what the beach is, that's your default value of two feet of erosion uh, on the beaches in North Carolina. You might notice that Carolina Beach here is mostly two feet. The reason that stays at that is because it's continually renourished. Carolina Beach and Riceville Beach are two of the most renourished beaches in the entire world. By the way, it's now called storm mitigation instead of renourishment. Sounds better, right? <laughs> 
So if you look at that, you can see also, look at this area of the north end of Carolina Beach, this is Freeman Park, three feet, five feet, 11 feet of erosion a year in those. And this is why they call the inlets, inlet hazard areas. That's because these are constantly shifting and losing sand. This is down at the other end, Fort Fisher. At Fort Fisher, you're losing five, seven, nine feet a year as well. One of these days, the aquarium will be on the beach. And of course, we have a little thing with hurricanes too. Uh, this is a record year this year, almost. It's not as many as 2005 yet, although we did just name Epsilon, uh, I think, today. So we're now from 25, we're now up to 26 named storms for 2020. So in 2020, we've had 26 so far, 10 have made landfall, but it's nowhere near the number of hurricanes and major hurricanes that occurred back in 2005, which is still the record year. This was the Katrina, Rita, Wilma year uh, that I'm sure a lot of you remember. This is, of course, Hurricane Florence coming into Wilmington. Uh, actually made landfall at uh, Riceville Beach and sat over us forever and ever. And one of the things that we're seeing with hurricanes is that they're seeming to hold more water and move more slowly. Well, why is that? Well, warm air can hold more moisture. The other thing that's happening is some of the steering currents that usually generate from you know, these changes in uh, pressure from high to low pressure, some of these steering currents are not near as strong uh, in some cases either. So these are some of the things that study is looking at right now. So how about this sea level stuff? Well, this is the sea level curve, as you can see. And this area from 1970 to about 2000 is kind of a flat one, as you see there, it's increasing. But then look at this since 2000. What we've seen is that there's been a rise from 1.4 millimeters per year at the end of the last century in the 1980s and 90s. And now that sea level rise is 3.6 millimeters per year in this time frame. Some people expect this to continue to rise. Much of our increase in sea level has de been derived from uh, um, rising waters or water expanding because of the thermal capacity of the oceans. You warm water in a pot, it grows higher, right? That's exactly what's happening with the oceans. The other place that we're getting water is from melting of continental uh, ice sheets. And there's been a slightly increasing amount from Greenland and Antarctica. The fear is, you know, what will happen if we have lots more of the continental ice sheets uh, melting. So this is looking at mean highest water. I'm going to show you this again because I'm looking at the beach here. So there is three feet. By the way, maximum elevation on Riceville Beach is about 10 feet. There's what it is at five feet. And the problem on our beaches is not just that it's coming from the ocean side you're raising water on the backside as well. So the islands are narrowing from both directions. And that's part of the issue that we have in those areas. And so with sea level rise and uh, some of this nuisance flooding that I mentioned to you, I love this quote, this is the new normal, it's a floodier future. And so what that's looking at is slightly increased amounts of high tide flooding associated with you know, the high tide, but also the rising sea level that we have. So Wilmington is one of those that you know, has some floodier future. Uh, so we need to design our infrastructure to try and meet those things. So I thought I would end up, I don't know what time it is now, you guys may be getting tired of me, but let, bear with me for a minute or two and let me show you a couple of the rules and regulations that are really ones that are so impactful uh, to us today and what's been happening uh, over the last couple of years. So I just want to show you a couple of these. We could go all night on all these different rules and regulations, but let me just pull out a couple uh, so that you can see them. So this is what was posted in the New York Times back in July of this year. So what this is showing you is the environmental rules that are looking at the uh, rolled back, reversed, or modified. 
And so how they broke this out was looking at air pollution and emissions, drilling, mining, extraction, infrastructure, animals, water pollution, toxic substances and safety and others. So what you can see is a large majority of them were in here. So what this shows you in orange is those that rollbacks have been completed. These are basically in force or they're being litigated. Some of these are being planned in the yellows. So I just thought I would show you a couple of these. I could ask you, what would you name as some of your most concerning rules and regulations? that have been looked at. I want to look more at a couple of the big ones that I consider, you know, what was truly whenever I was growing up and moving through school that were so impactful to consideration of environmentalism that we have. But I want to start off with a really big win. And I give Trump credit for uh, signing this in. I give the Senate and the House credit for signing this in. This was a bipartisan, whoa, believe it or not, bipartisan uh, agreement to pass the Great American Outdoor Act. This was really big. In fact, it was said to be one of the biggest land conservation uh, wins or legislation in a generation. I also want you to know how people vote because that's we're in the voting season, as you know. So both Senators Burr and Tillis voted for the Great American Outdoors Act, but our representative in the House did not. And what you can see here is the Senate passed this remarkably, 73 to 25, and the House 310 to 107. You know, a truly good deal for us all. And why is this a good deal? Well, number one, it established monies for our national park system was designed to provide monies for fixing all that maintenance that hadn't been done in years and years and years. And six and a half billion dollars is earmarked for 419 national park units. You can see one of them is Moore's Creek over here, right up the road. By the way, Moore's Creek could be added to that list too. It's a great place to go. It also guarantees $900 million per year to the land and water conservation fund. By the way, this was set up years ago to get this money from royalty payments from offshore oil and gas. It just hadn't been fully funded in a long time. So this new legislation is to guarantee that funding level. There's another one though that really bothered me. If you look back in the environmental rules and regulations, you can have your own preference as to what you think is most important. But I think the overarching rule of NEPA is probably one of the most important things that was ever put into place. This policy act that was put in 1969 and signed in law in 1970 really looked at a lot of things. It's kind of looked at what you would do for, um, you know, saying something about what we call environmental assessments and environmental impact statements is to look and assess the impact of major projects in an area. So if you were going to do a project, build a road through an area, you have to do some you know, due diligence to determine what the impacts of that roadway would be. So some people have looked at this and said that you know, environmental groups, tribal activists, and others have used the law to delay or block uh, lots of infrastructure, logging, and drilling projects. Okay? Others would look at this and say that it saves you know, people and communities because of the impact or potential impact on those areas. But this particular rule, if it stays in, and there's lots of people challenging this now, as it says here, the proposal would affect virtually every significant decision by the federal government that affects the environment. And that's because whenever you do major projects that you have to do this assessment of alternatives and harm or not. So just a few comments on that one. It says it would be the most substantive change since the 1970s. It's a bedrock conservation law. Uh, the Trump administration has claimed that this would save hundreds of million dollars over a decade. 
because it reduces the time allowed for completing reviews. Some people have said that you know, these things take three to 10 years. And so by that time, you know, the project has basically gone so overboard and so much over cost that you can't get it done. Saying that the mountains of red tape that are in there and this lengthy permit process has really held up infrastructure projects. Well, you know, there are issues with some regulations, but on the whole, this one really needs to be looked at because you really need to think about what are the impacts. And one of the big things with an environmental impact statement, it produces the cost factor for all the alternatives that are due. So the Trump administration has said, this is the way to maintain our global competitiveness. Well, other people have said a few other things. And in fact, some have said that this instrument is protection, not just for the environment, but also for social justice issues. Because in poor communities where many things go, this is you know, one of the things that is most important. So the NEPA process you know, looks at all these impacts on the community for the area that the stuff is going through. And it's an essential frontline control or protection for those communities. So one of the things that has been looked at with this is some people have said this may be the biggest single giveaway to polluters in 40 years. I don't know if that's the case, but you know, this is what this one said. Uh, NEPA requires federal agencies to integrate environmental values into decision making, which I think is a pretty important thing to do. And the other thing that is important says the rule changes the definition of effects that must be considered to eliminate cumulative and indirect responses or actions and controls. So one of the things that you really need to look at is, you know, if I'm doing something, it's not just that little area where you're putting the piling down. What is it doing to the surrounding area? And that's one of the keys for the NEPA process that I think is so important. Another one that has been looked at is what's called the WOTUS rule, that's waters of the US. Um, this particular one is a rollback of an Obama uh, era rule that looked at you know, defining what are the waters of the US. And this is based all in the Clean Water Act. It's also called the Navigable Water Rules Protection Rule. Uh, that you look at. And what this is saying is, you know, what are connected waters? That's the real issue. And a lot of people have said over the years that, you know, if I've got a farm pond or a ditch or a little waterway that dries up and then that the Obama administration included all of those in waters of the U.S. So many farmers and others said, you know, that's a bad thing. It's, you know, overstepping bounds and taking control of our land. Well, I'm gonna tell you, that is not what was in that rule. That rule did not include any ditches or farm ponds that would be considered as part of the connected waters of the US. This was one of those things that was hyped to make people feel like there was infringement on their rights. So the Environmental Protection Agency uh, that we have you know, always looked at this, say that, you know, the Obama administration did a massive federal overreach of this. And immediately 27 states sued whenever that law was proposed in 2015. So the waters of the US by Obama administration never came into being. So the rule that was announced by the uh, Trump administration is to say that, you know, these waterways are not gonna be included. And you're also not gonna include groundwater. Well, I have a little problem with that one because groundwater is connected. Water infiltrates into the ground and then flows into our waterways. And we've seen several instances in our counties in Duplin County and Sampson County where the water that infiltrates in the ground then flows into the streams and you have an excess amount of nutrients such as phosphate and nitrogen in those waterways. So the whole definition and the problem came about what are connected waters? And this one, I'll just say, uh, 
sorry, that should be EPA, not EPS. EPA's own science committee said that EPA was not basing their decision on science. This was the own EPA science committee. So what they said is the proposed definition of WOTUS is not fully consistent with established EPA recognized science. That's kind of bad. So the advisory board for the science panel said they were disappointed that the EPA did not take note of the 300 page connectivity report that was done previously. It was basically ignored. So the departure from the original rule, you no, know, is not based in science. And as a science guy myself, I find that, you know, really disappointing. So let me just skip ahead one more of the Endangered Species Act, which is another you know, hallmark legislation that came about as I was coming of age. So the Trump administration has reduced uh, some of the uh, features of the Endangered Species Act, but it said that these burdens, these updates will ease the burden of regulations and transparency. The only problem is, I don't think there was a real harm there to begin with. Now, some people always bring up the idea of what was in the past with the spotted owl and the snail garter and other things. And admittedly, some of those did go overboard. But at the same time, you know, you need to discuss these things and not arbitrarily determine, you know, what is the uh, rule of the law or the best for the land and the animal. So until now, these are some of the changes. Uh, species that were deemed threatened, that means a category of organism at risk of becoming an endangered species. In other words, an endangered species is one that's on threat of extinction now. Threatened species is one that's in threat of being coming an endangered species at a near future time. So what they said was that these protections will be done on a case by case basis and not as a collective. They also said that they're going to consider threats that would affect the species in the foreseeable future. So, hmm, that's what we should have been doing. You know, that's kind of what it says. But the new change is going to be looking at this to consider threats that are likely to occur in the future. And so, what is likely? You know, when is that going to be? So this could ignore the threats of rising sea levels, for instance, to the sparrow on Masonboro Island, or issues associated with you know, sea level that's rising that could you know, lead to other issues for plants and animals. And also the administration prohibited the consideration of the economic impact of listing a species. So these are not good rules and regulations either. And let me just show you, I think, one more. Uh, as I say, we've got a bunch of these that we could go. I'll, I'll have mercy on you. So this particular one, scientists are concerned by record high global emissions. So what would you do if you heard that thing? You would want to reduce the emissions, right? So what does the current administration say? We're going to eliminate the major methane rule. <laughs> so instead of capping and reducing leaks that we have in some of our operations, they're not going to do that anymore. And emissions of methane have hit some of their highest levels on record. So the methane rollback that was said, they want it to be simpler and less burdensome for the oil company. They wanted to promote energy independence and economic growth. It would save oil producers $19 million a year. I'm telling you, that's a pittance. Now, what did the oil company say? This is the president of Shell Oil in the United States. The negative impacts of leaks and fugitive emissions have been widely acknowledged for years, so it's frustrating and disappointing to see the administration go in a different direction. The oil companies don't even want it. And this is Exxon and Chevron said the same thing too. So why are you doing this? 
this is just beyond me for what's doing other than the fact that you know it's going in a totally opposite direction so the clean power plan is another one that you could look at and replace the clean power plan with the affordable clean energy or ACE rule that's weaker than the clean power plan. And by the way, let me just finish with this. North Carolina was already almost meeting. They were only 5% away from meeting the entire clean power plan three years ago. So they were already there and many states were. And that's because of our renewable energy mandate in North Carolina and the solar increase that we've had. So a lot of people looked at this as, you know, well, we're going to produce and boost coal. Well, there's the coal line. That didn't just start recently. That started all the way back here with the Bush administration, Obama administration. And see what it's done under the Trump administration? It's actually dropped further. There hadn't been more jobs in coal, and there's certainly no more coal being produced. And I promise you, there will not be a single coal plant built in this country in the future. There just won't be, because everybody has recognized that natural gas and renewables are much better alternatives. They're cheaper and they're much cleaner than that is. And the EPA itself said that their own assessment, the proposal will lead to thousands more deaths from air pollution. So again, the own EPA said that this was a bad idea. So anyway, there's lots of things to consider, including biodiversity and species loss. Uh, I invite you to read this Living Planet report, just came out and talks about all kinds of things. Uh, I'm gonna leave you with this one before I get to the final. There's actually a newly coined phrase for insect declines. It's the windshield effect. So owing to the fact that if you drove your car at dusk 30 years ago, you would need to clean the windshield frequently. That's no longer the case today. That's really true. <laughs> so anyway, I want you to vote on November 3rd and it especially matters for nature, sustainability, and environmental justice. And that's not just in our area, it's across the United States. And what we need is a healthy environment for a healthy economy. And all those things are really important. And I would usually say in my closing comment in the election year that you might have a write-in, but I don't think you want to do that. But I'm going to... <laughs> There's the guy that you can vote for if you don't like any of those other guys uh, as well. And let me just finish now by saying that's my pitch for the environment and all the beauty, but a few of the issues in Southeastern North Carolina. Thank you, Roger, so much. Do we have any questions for Roger? You would need to unmute um, yourself. You can put something in chat as well. Hi, Roger, I have a question. My name is Gail. Yep. Um, when you were quoting the number of gallons of water that go over the, uh, the dams in the Cape Fear River, how was that measured? You know, like a 5 billion versus 100 million. How, how was that actually getting estimated or measured? I wish I had you for my students. That's a, that's a really good question. And that's the kind of question that I like to hear. So what do you do in these areas? There's a gauging station right there at the dam. And so imagine if you will, there's a float in there. I've got a pipe, there's a float in it. And as the water level rises in the river, that float rises up. So what I end up with is a stage height for the river. And by knowing the dimensions of the river, that you got in that area. It's a cross table that you can do then to calculate how many gallons are actually going through there. Because discharge, which is the amount of water, is basically just area times velocity. So that's how we get that information. It, it seems like past a certain point though, it seems like the numbers might get a little fuzzy, but. And in fact, it gets a little fuzzy whenever Florence occurred because Florence 
went over the gauge height. Well, right, right. That's what I'm saying. Yep. And but that's only happened one time. But good okay. question. Great. Thank you. Do we have anybody else that has any questions for Roger? I have I have another question. <laughs> okay. Um so the uh the, the chemicals the pfos chemicals is there any way of filtering those out of filtering them out yes can they be filtered out of water uh yes uh there are several ways to do that and our water treatment plants are taking two uh different approaches uh the best of the best is uh reverse osmosis and basically in reverse osmosis, you're filtering out and micro uh, fibers, right. all of those different uh, chemicals. Only thing with reverse osmosis is you have to uh, use a lot more water because then you have to back flush to clean out the filter. Right. Right. Uh, so reverse osmosis though will get 99 plus percent. That's what Brunswick County water treatment plant is doing. So their plant upgrade is gonna be a hundred million dollar venture. CFPOA for Wilmington is using GAC or granulated activated carbon. Oh. And so in those particular ones, that's been found to get about 95 plus percent out of the waters. This is much less expensive. It's about 49, $50 million for them to input their design uh, criteria. But both of those can effectively do it. And what I mentioned about the Timor's plant itself, they're inputting those directly in the plant, uh, including that thermal oxidizer, because some of that material was going up the smokestack, you know, for air pollution. And then when it gets into the atmosphere, it rains down on the ground. That's why surrounding uh, communities, some of the surrounding houses with wells have contaminated water uh, in that area. So Comores has been supplying you know, bottled water and other uh, to them. And then one of the agreements is to give them reverse osmosis uh, also for the water treatment of the people surrounding the Comores plant. So okay. all that is something that you can do to remove that from the waters. So is the amount that's left in the water coming out of our taps after the water treatment uh, you know, processes, it, it, is, there, is it cause for concern, the amount that remains in the water coming out of our taps? If you can effectively remove 95 to 99% of that, you're way down below what the currently considered parts per okay. trillion would be for those. Okay. And right now, uh, well, one of the issues, just to be quite honest, we don't know what's safe for a lot of these chemicals. There's 80,000 chemicals uh, that are considered uh, chemical substances in the United States, and we probably only know about 100 of them. So the idea is that people throw the chemicals out there and you have to prove that they're harmful instead of them proving that they're safe. Right. So in these particular chemicals, what you have to look at is, you know, what are the suggested levels? Like PFOS and PFOA, uh, EPA has said 70 parts per trillion. And for the most part, it's below that in all of our waters. Gen X is 140 parts per trillion. And since 2018, it's been mostly all below 140 parts per trillion in the Cape Fear River. Any parts are bad, but you, know, you want to get them down as low as you can. Some people have suggested 10 to 15 parts per trillion would be you know, something that you'd want to get to. And that's where you would be for sure if you had the effective RO and GAC treatment. OK, thank you. Oh, Roger, I want to, I have a quick question, which is, I was wondering, uh, you were talking, it was, there was great news to hear that there is real reduction 
in uh, the amount of point source discharge into the Cape Fear of PFAS and PFOAs. My question is, and this is probably complicated and somewhat experimental at this point, but how long will it take to work through the waterways? And how long will we continue to see this in significant levels in the soil? Really good question. Uh, the thing with these are called forever chemicals for a reason. So they really do are long lasting uh, in the environment. And what's been found in the Cape Fear River is that in the bed load materials, uh, material on the bottom of the stream is that there are chemicals within those. And some of our students and faculty have actually looked at some of the uh, bounding zones in the river system. And so there's a little bit of chemicals in with that as well, that's residual. So whenever you look at those, these chemicals are gonna take a long time to get fully out, but in the water itself, if you can reduce that at Chemours, for instance, uh, 99 plus percent, you've still got some issues upstream, right? Like I told you. So if it's upstream, it's gonna eventually flow our way. So that's the reason we need to make sure that we get our waters that we're drinking, you know, some kind of treatment to make sure that they're not gonna be at a slightly higher level for this collective of PFAS chemicals. Now, I don't think that we're probably gonna have an individual PFAS chemical except an unusual case that's above or, you know, high value. We still don't know what the collective uh, effect is of all of those PFAS chemicals together. So that's gonna be an important thing with more research to determine. It turns out that it looked like there was about a five to eight year time frame to get these chemicals, you know, for instance, out of your body. And the decline factor that you see in the environment, again, five to eight years for some of them, but some of those are gonna stay much longer. So we need to make sure they're no longer going into the water and also that we're treating the water supply to be able to make sure we don't have those higher levels because they will stay around a while, as you say. Okay, so thank you uh, to Roger. Thanks so much. Um, and we have our monthly program in November. Don't forget that. And thank you all for participating. And remember to vote by November 3rd. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for showing up. And I uh, hope you have a good night and good week. It's a great time to be outside. So enjoy. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, appreciate it.